Wow. There's a thought in my head, and it's, it has something to do with tigers and stripes. Tigers changing their stripes. Anyway, um, let's give Microsoft a round of applause just, just one more time. This, this, is, uh, this is actually one of the most complete specifications we have inside of the foundation today. It's a, it's a very, very thorough contribution. Uh, and we, uh, we absolutely welcome Microsoft into this community. Um, if you don't think open compute is changing the world, then you, know, you obviously weren't listening to Kashagra, you weren't listening to Bill Ling this morning or Frank. It's, it's great to see uh, companies like Microsoft getting involved uh, with this project. Um, our next speaker here is no stranger to this stage. Uh, he comes from Facebook. Uh, he's here to talk a little bit about data center infrastructure management. Please help me welcome Tom Furlong from Facebook. Hello, my name's Tom Furlong. Uh, my, my responsibility at Facebook is for all the data center and server uh, infrastructure. And uh, one of my current uh, passions is around a solution for DCIM. Um, like most of our Facebook kind of messaging, we start around the efficiency story, because really this is how we uh, started to internalize DCIM, the need for it. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, software, hardware, and data center efficiencies. Jay Parikh, in his talk this morning, actually stole most of my thunder. He talked about HHVM, the, the virtual machine on the software side. He talked about uh, OCP hardware and obviously the Prineville-style data centers that we have. Um, also in efficiency, you have the linkages between the software, the hardware, and the data center. And we've done a lot of work in Facebook between hardware and software, aligning the capabilities of the hardware with the needs of the software. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Really what I want to talk about today is how do we align the hardware to the data center. So this gets into basically a capacity question. How do you put as much hardware into the data center as you can uh, and have it uh, with a reasonable level of risk tolerance? So in terms of this problem, you basically look at two things. You've got a capacity. The capacity is fixed in the data center. You have a certain amount of electrical capacity uh, in, the, in the system itself. Um, you also have a workload. And for us, uh, our workload looks rather uh, sinusoidal. Uh, we have uh, day, peaks of the day, and we have peaks of the week. But essentially, uh, you have an up-down workload. Now, you, we also, we have a regional failover model, so we tend to reserve some amount of capacity so that we can fail over to, uh, if a region has a problem, we will fail the, to the traffic of the user out of that region, and it will be distributed across our other regions. Um, we also, when we launch products, don't always know exactly what they're going to need. Uh, or uh, if the user adoption is faster than we think, we may need to add hardware. And so we try to put some provision for growth in there. It's not, uh, we don't do it often, but it depends on what the particular product or service is. And lastly, you have a little bit of headroom, or some people call it buffer, or you call it you know, reserve. Um, that amount really protects you from uh, exceeding your capacity threshold. And when you do that in the data center world, you end up tripping breakers and you have machines that go offline. So this in itself, if you're able to increase your utilization by reducing that buffer, you can actually get more workload into your data center. The more knowledge you have about this, the better you're going to be able to plan. And in this case, this is a big, real, it's a real data problem. It's, it's, you've got data that uh, lives in the data centers themselves, in the building management systems, in the other systems you have in the data center. You also have a lot of data associated with the server information, which resides within, in our case, it resides within Facebook uh, in what is essentially a giant configuration management database that's measuring all of these different uh, factors, uh, very different uh, characteristics of the hardware and what's happening at any, any moment in time. And what we need to do is we need essentially one system that pulls all of this together, for those of you Lord of the Rings fans out there, one system to rule them all. Um, we need to combine that facility data with the IT data, uh, and really DCIM is the umbrella architecture for doing this uh, in our definition. That's very quickly kind of a background of why we want to do it. Um, I want to get a little bit more into kind of what we've done. Uh, and part of it is, how do you start something like this? Um, 
we looked at what we had internally, 42 different use cases. We looked at all the stakeholders that might use the data. We looked at how we would uh, kind of theorize about how we want the system to evolve going forward. Uh, and we ended up with this pretty detailed list of, of these use cases. And, we, we, and when you look at it, um, I'm, sometimes I'm kind of a third party guy. I'm like, can we go and actually find a third party system that can accommodate all of the use cases that we have. And we started a, a pretty elaborate RFP process to get out into the marketplace, evaluate all the various vendors out there, uh, and see whether we could uh, accommodate uh, the 42 use cases that we have. Now, we found out a couple of interesting things as we went through this. And, and again, I don't pretend that our solution is the solution that everybody needs to adopt. But one thing is, the data that resides in the facility, uh, we're like many typical uh, big facility operators. Building management systems are standard. You have them from Siemens. You have Allerton. You have all sorts of systems that are pretty standard out there. Um, internal to Facebook is a different story. That's all custom stuff that we've built over time to manage the scale of the infrastructure that we have. And it, kind of the epiphany we had along the way is, you know what? There are people who are really good at that data, that data that's coming out of the data centers, and we're really good at the data that is inside of our systems. And at the same time, we also, in order to manage this kind of continually growing, scaling footprint, we need to build tools on top of this. So it's not just good enough to have data that you can look at or, or you know, run a report or you know, see a screen or something. We actually want to build tools that allow us, uh, in our workflow, to use this information. So what it ended up really coming to mind was we're going to have this kind of hybrid model. We're going to work with a third party vendor. In this case, it was uh, CA Technologies and with our internal development teams. And we'll pull together uh, a mechanism by which we can gather all this data together under one, one roof. Um, once we have it there, we build tools on it. And then you know, from Facebook's standpoint, we're really happy. Um, so where are we today? Uh, we have implemented the CA solution in many of our data centers. Um, we have a constantly growing footprint, so the ones that are under construction right now don't have it yet, but will. Um, we have, in each data center, there are a couple of thousand uh, devices, and I'm not talking about servers, I'm actually talking about, if you think about generators, UPSs, breakers, um, fans, fan motors, pumps, all of the kind of things that you have inside these buildings. Uh, and we end up with, we end up pulling something like uh, 20 plus thousand points per data center uh, as information that we're gathering, including like alarm settings. And we decided after a while we'd just pull everything. And then we'll figure out later what we do with it. Um, we also have some tools that we started building on this. Uh, we have something called Cluster Planner, which allows us to basically automate the cluster uh, planning process, and we deploy in clusters of servers, several hundred racks at a time. And basically what this does is it optimizes the cluster layout to the amount of power capacity that we have available in the footprint in the data center. The clusters are not necessarily homogenous in terms of type of rack that's in there. We have different SKU types for the racks, storage, database, uh, front end, uh, uh, compute racks. And so the cluster planner helps us optimize this very, very quickly. Um, we used to do this, and, and we would uh, run this iteration multiple times before we deployed in a data center. And now doing this, instead of taking a couple of days for some engineers to sit down and run some real calcs on it, uh, kind of do a layout and all this, uh, we can do this in the space of an afternoon. We can go and, and redo it in a few hours. Uh, and it's really cut down the amount of time. It allows us to iterate. Uh, and for us, um, our capacity engineering team is kind of always fine-tuning, so we end up with very last-minute changes that this um, quickly allows us to accommodate. Um, there's also some other cool things in there. There's uh, something we call Power Path, which can map out the power path within the data center, show where, what power consumption is at various points, um, and you can kind of extrapolate on things you might be able to do with that. So, I should have advanced this, my apologies. So the other thing I wanted to talk about really is lessons learned, because um, as I said, I, I, think, I think we can be an example of things that we have tried. Um, I don't think that our solution necessarily works for everybody in this room. Some people may be able to utilize a full third party solution uh, because of the type of apps you run and, and how you're structured. Others uh, will opt more for the custom route. 
Um, but I think the lessons learned are actually slightly universal. Um, so execution, data quality, rationalization, and prioritization. And on the execution side, I can't tell you how hard this project is. Um, and you've got to figure out how you can try it before you actually buy it. Part of our RFP process was to have the um, two finalist companies do what we called a proof of concept. And in the proof of concept, they actually uh, had access to our data centers, and they were uh, required to take a, a subset of one of our big buildings and actually show how they were moving this data and what their system could do, the capabilities it could do. From that, we realized that uh, actually, there were a lot of things that we weren't including and that we wanted to include in it. So uh, for you who know our, our uh, infrastructure, we have the blue battery cabinets. Um, those actually don't get tracked through BMS. They're through a separate system. And so, as, so we uh, implemented a further step on that that we called a pilot program. And the pilot program was soup to nuts, one data center building. It was Prineville 1, that building right there. I want everything in that building. I want you to show me that you can get this into our system. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect, but at least from that standpoint, we, we prove that it works. Um, again, truly valuable lesson because we learned how important this next concept was, which was the data quality issue. I, we have uh, six of these buildings that are completed or under construction. Uh, I like to feel that we have done a good job in keeping consistency across these. I can tell you for a fact, no matter how hard uh, we have done that, um, it's not perfect. And, and the net result is every single facility you need, to, you need to look at in nauseating detail to make sure the data is correct. As an example, uh, one of our, um, our, we have an Allerton system in one building, we have Siemens in another, uh, and I don't know which one is which in terms of this, this question, but one of them presents data in kilowatts. One of them presents data in watts. So when you have two data sources and one comes out a thousand times larger than the other, it's, it really kind of throws you. Um, you know, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, we had a, a minor outage recently of an of a in-row UPS. Uh, we still have some of those in our system. And uh, it didn't affect any of the, the customer gear. It didn't affect any of the gear, nothing to the user. Uh, and it was only realized by somebody walking past it and realizing it was an alarm. And it's like, wait a second. OK, we've done, like, I think we've really done a good job on commissioning our facilities. We're very rigorous about it. But we still had things that missed. I don't care if it's if at the scale that we're at, you miss stuff. And this data quality was really something that hit us hard. Uh, and we really, really, really believe that you, the amount of work we did to, to clean this up was extensive. Uh, and uh, you know that's kind of my, my uh, advocacy to all of you. Um, it also leads into the next point. So as I said, we're pulling thousands of, thousands of points. And this data, because we have so many users, potential users of the system, um, they're not experts in the architecture of the data center. Uh, they may not know exactly what it is that they're looking for or that they're, you know, the data that they're pulling. And one of the things that we realized we really needed to do was we need to qualify the data that people are looking at. So some systems pull. They have a 15-second uh, latency, for instance, or maybe even a minute or a 10-minute latency. Um, you need to know that if you're trying to compare peak uh, con power consumption from looking at your server workload peaking and your data center power consumption peaking. If one of those is lagging the other, like you're not going to have good data. And so um, the ability to look at, at and have really um, qualified uh, in your kind of reporting, in the visuals that you have that people are looking at, uh, make sure people understand what it is that they have. Because otherwise, they're going to look at it, and it'll be garbage to them because they don't understand truly what they're looking at. What, what they're looking at. Um, the last one is, y you know the story, like how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? 42 use cases. When you think about that, we had use cases that spanned the gamut uh, that focused on things like the efficiency stuff I'm talking about, but also stuff to yeah, the next panel is going to talk about sustainability and environmental. So uh, Bill, who runs our sustainability program, wants to do things like be able to uh, do carbon calculation out of it. And for that, you need KWH, and you need to accumulate KWH data. Um, I'd also argue that you can use that to validate uh, energy billing and other things that you do on the power side. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that, that... But when you look at kind of the breadth that, you're, that you have of potential uses of this, 
you've got to sit there and start and really focus on one aspect. And so for us, we really focused on the basic capacity efficiency. So this is the utilization. Um, but the real goal is like, what else can you do beyond that? Uh, but you got to start with something or else you're going to be all over the map and you got way too many, uh, way too many people you're trying to satisfy. So what's next? Um, we're basically continuing to turn the crank, I would say, on implementation. Uh, you know, that's now become a reasonably easy part now that we've uh, stumbled over it a few times. Uh, and as data centers come online in our locations, uh, Sweden and others, like, we'll add those into the system. The second thing is some of the tools that I talked about, like Cluster Planner. Cluster Planner is live now for us. That is the way we now plan clusters. Um, it was in beta a few months ago. Now that, that is the tool. Um, the things like the power path and others, those are, those are basically working, but we've got a, a large uh, number of things that are also uh, in the works. And, and I think the real interesting stuff for me is the what if, like what's beyond this? So it's one thing to talk about this from the standpoint of, hey, it helps me with the capacity efficiency. Um, but what other kind of crazy things can you do to actually help manage your infrastructure? Um, if you think about it, when you have an outage, a lot of times what happens is the guys who are monitoring the site see something go down. Well, they just see uh, an application shut down. You know, it goes away. They don't know what it is. They don't know if it's a network problem. They don't know if it's a data center problem. Um, imagine if very quickly they could go and pull that data center and see red, yellow, green if there was any kind of power interruption anywhere in that particular cluster or that data center. Like, you could very quickly eliminate what is you know, sometimes a timely problem of calling up and making sure you connect with somebody in the facility. Hey, is there some problem there? Oh, I don't know. I'll go out and check. You know, oh, I didn't get my beeper that said that, you know, my pager that said that we had an outage. Um, I think you can use it for things that you know, probably we haven't really kind of considered yet. Um, I think you can, uh, when you think about things around uh, the sustainability stuff, there's great potential. Um, you know, we tend to be uh, focused on the, the power energy side of our buildings. Uh, and part of the reason is, is because when we design them, we design them with full knowledge of how much uh, mechanical capacity we needed to support that. So, so to us, as long as we load the data center appropriately, we don't really have kind of the hotspot problem and, and other things. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of challenges because we are a full adiabatic outside air economized system. Um, the, the rate of change of uh, temperature and humidity within the data center has been something that we've been open about, and it's been a challenge to build, have the building management system accommodate. You know, does DCIM in some ways start giving us a better um, insight into what's happening inside the data center? Uh, you know, do we have enough instrumentation inside to talk about kind of the mechanical, the, the, the environmental stuff? Um, so again, I think there's, you know, sky's the limit on the implementation. Uh, I think when I started this, I kind of thought of this some, sometimes as a project, like we'll get this done. Uh, what has been the evolution of thought is like this isn't a project, this is a program that's probably going to run the lifespan of, of Facebook. We will continue to evolve it over time. Uh, I've talked to a couple of people, my counterparts at some other large companies, and said, oh, I'm talking about DCIM, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we've been working on DCIM, yeah, five years now. You know, and it's, and it's like, okay, I get it. Um, we've had starts and stops with it before this. This is, I think, the most serious effort that we've put into it. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to kind of continuing to give people some idea of what it looks like. Uh, it's getting late in the day, but tomorrow I know um, we have a booth over in the back of the exhibition hall. Um, we have a couple of monitors and we have some screenshots from some of the tools that we have in an animation that's gonna run. So tomorrow when you're here, truck on back and, and uh, take a look. It's, it only takes a couple minutes to run through it. So it's, uh, it just looks at uh, some of the um, power mapping, some of the thermal mapping, uh, things that we have along with our, our mapping system. Uh, so it might be kind of interesting. Anyway, thank you very much for hanging out. I know it's later in the day. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Cole. <laughs>